Internet, we meet again. And this challenge, uh, I was able to do by myself without cheating again. So that's a pat on the back. Very excited about that. All right, so the challenge today for Ethernaut is called Force. So our goal here is pretty simple, actually. So the goal is to uh, make the balance of the contract greater than zero. That's all we have to do. Now, some of the hints or things that might be useful are all fallback methods to understand these, uh, to basically write another contract to interact with this contract to do what we're trying to do here. And then also to go to the Beyond Console, which is gonna refer us to Remix, or uh, I think it's Hard Hat or something, to create a contract and deploy it so we can interact with this contract on the test net that we're on. So that is our challenge, is force. Now, our code is a beautiful little cat. And let's see if we can pull that up in VS Code, because I think I have it here. Yes, here it is. All right. So, in our code, there's really not much to look at. You know, the code review here is very simple. We have a pragma. Remember, floating is not good, we should have fixed. And then also, we just have a massive comment. And this comment has a beautiful little kitty here that's saying meow with a question mark. Now, this challenge um, is quite confusing if you don't necessarily know it's being discussed, um, but you can kind of intuit what, what it's trying to do for you. So what I did initially was basically typed in force, um, uh, force a contract in Solidity or something along those lines. And the second or third link that I came across, and actually sit back, you know, success, you know, we should celebrate the small things in life. Congratulations, you did it without cheating. And here, they said they're using Force, so I, I thought of Force Awakens or like using the Force Star Wars style. Anywho, um, I'm gonna go down to the resources and say this one here, this is the link that came across, I came across initially. We're basically typing in Force and Solidity and I came across this basically explains how you can forcibly send Ether to a contract that isn't necessarily explicitly accepting Ether. Ether. And as you and I know from the work that we've done in the previous challenges, there's a few ways that one can receive Ether. So first and foremost, um, there's either a payable uh, kind of decorator on a function. So we have you know a function and then saying it's payable on there. Or another way is uh, using receive, which is a newer method. So we're gonna put a receive function in there to receive Ether. Or we have our old faithful fallback function, which basically collects Ether um, both of these collect ether if there is not a function explicitly mentioned in the ABI when you're calling that contract, which is where this case would fall into play. Now, those are the different ways that we understand how to send ether to contract um, via another contract or an account. Now, if you didn't kind of, kind of dig into this and understand uh, this vulnerability, you wouldn't necessarily know that there's a bypass to these. So you actually can send ether to a contract without explicitly having any of these mentioned inside of it, which is the case for us, right? because our contract has literally nothing in it. It just has some comments and it looks like a cap. So that's like, that's the biggest thing right here is understanding we can send, we can send Ether to a contract without actually explicitly stating that or having it, having it receive Ether or explicitly state that it can. That's the first thing. Now, the next thing is our notes. So I'm gonna go to the notes and we're gonna explain, I'm gonna walk through my notes and kind of walk you through my thought process when understanding this and how I would want to explain it to you. Um, all right, so first things first, I have a series of questions that I wanted to ask myself and answer for you. So the first question here is, how does one actually force Ether into a contract? How do we do that? Well, there are a few methods, but the one method that's going to help us here and that a lot of people discuss is using self-destruct. Now, self-destruct is basically, as it's pretty plain Jane with the, with the name, right? So you have a contract that's deployed currently, and you want to destroy this contract. And when destroying this contract, you're gonna basically kill off a lot of the, the data inside of it. It's gonna be historically uh, recorded on the blockchain, but it's not gonna be existing going forward. So you're gonna kill the data, right? And then another thing you're gonna do is you're gonna actually send the ETH. And you're gonna send the ETH to a targeted address when you call self-destruct, because it's gonna be self-destruct and then the address you wanna send that ETH to. So that's how you can send ETH to a contract without that contract explicitly stating that it's going to accept um, Ethereum through the three methods that we mentioned, which I have in my notes here, which is fallback, receive, and uh, payable decorators, right? That's how we can do it. So the next thing I wanted to ask myself and explain to you is um, 
why would you want to have self-destruct in the first place? It seems kind of counterintuitive that you would have something like this. And when reading through some of the explanations and use cases, um, some of the ideas and concepts that came across were these three. And they can kind of be bundled in together, but I separated them out. So first thing is spring cleaning. So maybe you have an old contract out there that you want to basically clean up the data and it's no longer useful. Maybe that contract has done its duties and it needs to go away. So that's the spring cleaning piece where, you've, where it's someone that needs to do and now it's time to destroy it. The next thing is a really horrible way of upgrading contracts, or at least from what I can see, is where you have a contract that's existing. Say we have contract, have contract A and we have contract B here. So contract B is new and it has a bug fix that's been, that's been deployed. So this contract is new and you want all your users to use this. What you could do is self-destruct here and send the ETH to contract B, but by doing so you're removing all the state as well and all the data that was kind of um, stored within this contract and you're starting fresh. So that's one way you could upgrade contracts. I, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't have enough information to recommend this. Um, it, there might be something I'm missing, but it doesn't seem you know super, super smart to do. And then the last one is break glass, right? So break glass in case of an emergency. So if somebody is hacked into your contract and they're siphoning off funds or they've potentially um, maybe ran a denial of service attack on your contract and nobody can use it, something's occurring with that contract where there's an emergency, well maybe the developer or the creator of that contract has basically embedded a self-destruct in there that only they can call. And in this emergency, you break glass and you basically um, self-destruct that contract so you're no longer impacting the users that are utilizing that contract. So those are the three major use cases, or at least ones that I've come across that seem seemingly uh, prominent or popular. All right, the next piece here is the hack itself and the vulnerability. Now there are a few different examples I've come across. So the example that we have here for our challenge is super duper basic. Uh, it's not really um, realistic, but there are some examples I've come across that are semi-realistic where for this specific um, example here that I came across, it discussed how the ownership was associated to the individual that could send Ether to a contract. And there was like a, there was an access, access control set up right here, right? So it's basically saying that whoever can send Ether to this contract is then um, allowed to be the owner. Now this access control is no bueno because you can just self-destruct your contract, send Ether, and you automatically become owner that way. That's one kind of example I came across. Another bit of information I came across is talking about the flaw here. And it's a flaw that is uh, prevalent through a lot of contracts that are specifically vulnerable to this attack, the self-destruct attack. And that's relying on this dot balance. So this dot balance, what is that? So this dot balance is basically saying that um, this is referring to this contract. So it's referring to the contract that it's inside of. So say this is the contract here, this is referring to that. And then the balance is obviously saying, you know, the balance inside of this contract, whatever this contract holds, that's the balance we care about. So it's saying the balance of this contract, that's what that means. Now, the flaw here is that from time to time, people will actually use this balance as a method of ensuring that the balance of the contract is consistent and it, and it's, uh, it never changes. And that brings us to this point here. So I'll explain this example in a second that I've highlighted here, but let's talk about invariant checking because that really falls into place what this balance is. So invariant checking. So there's an explanation here that's somewhat useful. I'll kind of read it out for you. So defining a set of variants, invariants, and checking that they remain unchanged after a single or multiple operations. This is typically a good design, provided that the invariants being checked are in fact actual invariants. All right, so when reading through this, I was like, what the hell is an invariant? So I did a bit of Googling, went to the Wikipedias, and found out that invariant is basically something that's unchangeable. It's just a fancy way of, mathematical way of saying that's, uh, that cannot be changed after an operation has occurred to it. That's really all it is. And this is a super simple example that shows you exactly what an invariant would look like. So you have a triangle, right? So we can rotate that triangle, we can reflect it, and we can trans, uh, translate it over and over. And when you do that, when you turn, flip, and uh, slide something, the invariant of this is potentially the length of the sides. So the length of the sides of this triangle are not changing no matter what um, operation we do to it. It's staying consistent over time. Now, if you go up here in the context of uh, Ethereum contracts, you can see that I've mentioned here. So a good invariant is something that's fixed. And an example of that that I found was the total supply of a contract or a token. 
So the total supply of this contract is X and that can't be adjusted because that's how many tokens have been minted um, or created that can be you know, exchanged throughout that contract or that ecosystem. So a bad invariant is uh, the ether stored in a contract, which is basically this dot balance, which is what we referred to here. And this can be adjusted if, uh, if done incorrectly, meaning that we can do a self-destruct and we can basically push more ether into this contract that is unexpected to exceed that because there's maybe there's no payable, uh, there's no payable uh, decorators, there's no receive and there's no fallback. But even if none of this is in there, we can still do our self-destruct and, and get in there and put more ether inside. Now that's kind of what invariant checking is. So you're checking to ensure that the thing hasn't changed. If so, then continue. And it's a way to kind of put some sort of access controller uh, control flow within the smart contract. Now a specific example of this that I came across was from Mastering Ethereum. And I don't think we'll go through the entire code base because it's quite lengthy and I don't want to explain all that. Um, but to summarize what we're looking at here, the, the premises of this contract is basically saying that uh, to play this game, you have to pay uh, 0.5 Ether. And it has to become, an, it has to be increments of 0.5 Ether. You can't exceed that um, when you're pushing this in. And when you're going through this, you get rewards and milestones, et cetera, et cetera. But the really important piece here is basically stating that you can't put more than, uh, more or less than 0.5 to play the game, right? Well, um, we can actually do a self-destruct and when we do a self-destruct, we could do a self-destruct of 0.1, uh, a 0 0.1 into this. And when you do the self-destruct of 0 0.1, you can see here it states that when putting in that 0 0.1, you can prevent other players, future players, from actually reaching their milestone, really interacting with the contract in any meaningful way. And that's basically a denial of service attack, right? We're, we're ensuring that this contract is no, there's no ability to interact with it. And there's another way of just sending an excessive amount of 10 ether to it. And that would be another way of basically um, causing somewhat of a denial of, uh, denial of service because what's, what's gonna happen is we're gonna lock all the rewards for that contract forever and nobody can get any more rewards from that contract. And this is just one example of how self-destruct can cause an issue, specifically when things are based off of a set amount and that set amount is then linked back to this dot balance here. You can see it being mentioned there. All right, so we know what the flaw is. We know what the kind of the hack is. So let's keep going through the notes. Uh, so a few of the resources that I wanted to share. I've already shared the blog. There's a video associated to that blog, so you should watch both. I'll link them. Uh, Mastering Ethereum has probably the better or the best explanation. So just take time to read through this explanation, understand the code snippet that I just walked you through, and understand kind of the primitive techniques and also the, um, the flaws here. So that's uh, probably one of the better explanations I've seen. Uh, another one, of course, is going to be our not linked video. Doesn't want to play nice. So I'll copy and paste it out. So we have a uh, smart contract programmer person is uh, always doing an amazing job explaining topics. And they've done the same thing here. And specifically, they talk through an example for, I think it's a game, a Ethereum game. And there's the code snippet right there as well below the video if you want to watch that. Another item here is going to be Ethernet, the Ethernet series that we've been following along since, and uh, he kind of does a different explanation than what I'm doing here. Um, so it would be useful to maybe watch both, or just his, or just mine, whatever you want. Those are the main resources that I want to link. All right, with that being said, let's actually solve the challenge. And I just closed the series. Good job, Dylan. All right, if we open this up, there's a whole bunch of gobble to gook here, so we're just going to delete that. All right, so we have our instance, and I want to see a few things. So first thing, I want to check the ABI. And we can see the ABI is absolutely empty, and there's nothing there. So the next thing we want to do is we want to check the address. So we can see this is the address, right? So we have our address, and then the other thing we can do is we can uh, get the balance of, not the block number, the balance. We can get the balance of this address to confirm that it's zero. So we want to bump that up from zero to whatever. It doesn't really matter. Now I have an attack contract here written that we can walk through quickly. And what I'll do is I'll put it in VS code because that is my preference. All right. Inside of our explanation here, let's walk through this quickly. So you can see we have our, uh, our basically our pragma set up here. We have to do dot eight because that's what Remux prefers. Um, we're gonna import this, which actually isn't needed. So we can just ignore that. Uh, the next part, so this is the contract, right? So this is our attacker contract. First, we're going to um, ensure that we're taking the force contract. And actually this, 
isn't needed either. You know what? I'm just realizing I'm just got a bunch of stuff in here I don't need. All right, the constructor. This is needed because we need to put an address in there. First, we're going to basically put the address of the vulnerable contract we're going to attack. So that's going to be um, the cat contract. We call this cat, and we're going to ensure that this contract isn't is payable, and it's going to be placed inside of this uh, this variable here. Now, the next piece here is a function. So this function is an attack function. It's a payable function. And what we're going to do here is we're going to require that the value is greater than zero. So we're going to we're going to ensure that the person that's calling the attack is actually sending ether to uh, the, the contract we want to attack when we run self-destruct. So there's actually value in it. Additionally, we're going to basically take that contract address and put it inside of this variable here, ensuring that it's payable. And we're going to put that into our self-destruct function, which eventually then you know executes it, and we make the attack the person that how was attacked sad. This is what a sad person looks like in my drawings. Maybe you should make that blue. You know, this is why you watch these videos. Just to watch me fuck around and make little sad drawings. Look, we just attack them and they're sad. Okay. All right. Cool. That is the way this functions. So we're going to go here and we're going to compile our contract, which is control S or command S, or you can come over here and say compile. And then we're going to deploy our contract. And we need to deploy our contract to the address that we're going to target, which is where this constructor comes into play. And our address is here because we've already pulled that. So we're going to do a deploy. And I've already messed this up. Good job. So it needs to be inject web three. So we're actually calling the same test network and we're calling the address on the test network that we need to interact with. So we've, we've popped this up. We're going to say confirm. And this is going to confirm. All right. So if we just add three way, or two of three, what doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. We're gonna put some way in this. So when we call this contract on attack, it will send a very, very small amount of way to that contract, which is bumping the balance up, which is helping us win the challenge. All right, so we got a green check mark. This is good. So if we run the balance again, we can see that our balance is no longer at zero. Now it is at three way. So if we close this out, submit our instance, say continue and wait 3000 years, we will eventually see that we've won, level completed. And you can see it basically calls out some of the information we discussed and the invariant piece around this dot balance. With that being said, internet, I'll see you on the next challenge, which is called Bolt.